Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to do a video now on René Guénon and the philosophy of traditionalism. In this video, we'll cover the whole book, The Crisis of the Modern World. Definitely essential reading within the school of forbidden texts because like Julius Evola and Said Kutba, Guénon shows you what an actual rebellion against the system and its ideology would look like. Not the counterfeit revolution, which the academic industry will sell you for a very high price, but rather the Orwellian thought crime of challenging things which cannot be questioned, like materialism and democracy and progress itself. And he really does something similar to Evola, but arguably in a way which is more accessible to the general reader, but still extremely profound in its insights. And what Ganon does really is show that progress itself is something of a misnomer. A definition of progress um, would hold that whatever um, is new has devalued what came before it because it is unprecedented and never thought of before. But everything which defines our era of progress was already known in the world of tradition. Uh, mechanization, uh, scientific materialism, democracy itself, they were known in the world of tradition, but they were properly recognized as being what they actually are, which is signs of decline, signs of a civilization in which something has gone wrong on a spiritual level. Although there is a true crisis of Western progress unfolding as we speak, even though that's the one unthinkable thought you're not allowed to have, that progress might come to an end, this is not only because the civilization of progress, the Western civilization, is finite like any other civilization. In other words, like Spangler and uh, even Khaldun, Vico, um, he acknowledges that civilization um, by its very definition will not last forever. It does have a finite life cycle. Um, but on a deeper level, the cyclical nature of history itself dictates that we're living in the end of a much broader cycle even than just this one civilization. The Kali Yuga, or the final dark age, is something which not only will end, but it will be replaced presumably by a better age, because it'll restart a much broader cycle. We must, in turn, prepare a way out of this dark age rather than pretend that it'll just go on forever. To do so, however, we have to abandon the epistemological toolkit of modernity itself. If we have a psychological explanation of the modern world, um, in accord with the laws of materialism, which are fashionable today, we might at best have an accurate description. We will never have an adequate one. For that, you need to uh, fall back on that forbidden subject of absolute truths, which can only be spiritual rather than material. So so in the first chapter, The Dark Age, he revisits the Hindu doctrine of the human cycle in which history has four periods, the Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. This is something which you can find in the Book of Daniel, for example, with the statue with a golden head. And then by the time you travel down to his feet, it's, it's iron symbolizing a type of uh, primordial spirituality with, which gradually becomes more obscure as you work along this process of decline. The end, however, is not a total end, but rather a new beginning of the cycle. But this will mean, of course, the complete negation of anything which we've called progress, which is just the um, uh, growing materialization which naturally occurs as you fall away from the pure spirituality which would define the golden age. It is somewhat misleading, however, to speak of matter and spirit in the terms that we use them today. It is more proper to contrast the movement away from the principles of absolute truth with the return to them. Okay. Although it is true that we only have clear history from some 6,000 years back, this is not because the people before then were just a bunch of cavemen, as stereotype would hold. There were actually cities during that time, which was actually much more advanced in all of the levels that actually matter than our era. The only reason we have lost them is because they were made of wood rather than some more durable material. And in addition, there was not a lack of knowledge in the Golden Age, there was actually a purified version of it. Philosophy in the modern sense of the term is itself an unprecedented and devastating deviation away from the kind of real knowledge which you had in tradition. And the most profane form which this philosophy takes is that in which it just openly celebrates its lowly status by proclaiming itself humanism, or merely human, 
and proclaiming itself rationalism, or merely rational by the standards of a single finite human thinker. On the contrary, tradition valued the kind of knowledge which is decidedly non-human, which is super-rational, which is true wisdom rather than mere conjecture. It's peculiar that even our scientific knowledge is only ever, at best, approximation. Unfortunately, the modern attitude is not only ignorant, it actively denies all super-rational truth as being impossible. Even misguided attempts to imitate the ancient sacred doctrines inevitably allow them to degenerate into paganism as mere superstition and exterior manifestation and nothing more. For this reason, the end of the Middle Ages was not the Renaissance as we'd normally think in some positive sense. Rather, that is itself decline, because you have um, the decline of the feudal system in favor of nations in the more modern sense. You have the decline of spirituality with the Protestant Reformation into nothing more than private sentimental religiosity. And therefore, even the term Renaissance is something of a misnomer. You see a consistent sign of decline no matter which example you might take, and that is um, linguistification itself, as I use the term, in which empirical facts are no longer attached to any principle as such, and are freed up to kickstart a linearly infinite amassing of so many un unimportant details and a flurry of ever more short-lived, unfounded hypotheses which replace one another quickly. Yet, an yet any claim to technological domination fundamentally misses the point that we are the ones being dominated. As he says himself, the more they have sought to exploit matter, the more they have become its slave, thus dooming themselves to ever increasing agitation, without rule and without objective, to dispersion in pure multiplicity leading to the final dissolution. Over in chapter 2, The Opposition Between East and West, he um, does something similar to Oswald Spangler by asking how there have always been many civilizations, each of which has developed in a manner natural to it but still in a finite set of phases which will come to an end. Whereas the West is currently defined as the anti-traditional civilization as such, any civilization which had remained faithful to tradition at that time were merely left in the East, for example, um, India. This is not to say that the West, however, has always been anti-traditional in its nature. It is just that the process of decline started there earlier, kind of like Ibn uh, uh, Said Qutbah's observation that the power leak, although it's almost globalized at this point, it began particularly in the United States. In fact, it's wrong to speak about uh, learning about tradition as something like uh, the cliche of Eastern appropriation, because the extreme North, or the Hyperborean, is the origin of the Western tradition itself. The greatest era of tradition in the West was actually the prehistoric period, which has only come to be misunderstood as the darkest era of ignorance as a result of our own ignorance of the properly cyclical nature of time itself. However, one must also escape the temptation of escapism or the invention of pseudo-traditions which never really existed as being good enough. You only really have it if there is some genuine spirit which can appear within the pneumatic horizon of hermeneutical interpretation itself. In other words, it's not just a game. There is a serious ontological requirement to actually have tradition at that level. No matter how sincere or well-founded one's intentions might be in such a case, the result of doing so will only be more disequilibrium because the linguistification of tradition itself is not good enough. For example, the real Atlantean form in its whole civilization um, unfortunately did vanish thousands of years ago. We cannot restore it. We can only accept its inaccessibility to us. Still, it's a legitimate question to ask how a real revival of tradition might differ from a merely archaeological or literary reconstruction. The traditional elements of a dead civilization can only be revived or even understood through some contact with the living tradition. For this reason, Guénon finds it very doubtful, to use his own words, that there is any living uh, Druid tradition still anywhere within the world, contrary to what John Michael Greer, for example, would say. In other words, there really is a serious difference between having the real existence of some spirit 
and merely providing an artificial, linguistified reconstruction of it. It's tricky, of course, to speak of reviving Western tradition, since one must bear in mind that the same meaning, or rather the same spiritual absolutes, are really there in both East and West, insofar as tradition is far more than just mere custom or anthropological cultural practice. One has fundamentally misunderstood tradition, in fact, if one even tries to rationalize it away on purely human terms, there is a fundamental unity beneath the apparent plurality of many forms. In the case of Plato's allegory of the cave, you see maybe many shadows on the wall, many puppets, many reflections in the uh, water, many things walking the earth, but the end point is just the unity of the one, which can only be achieved on spiritual rather than material terms. Knowledge of the spiritual truths is therefore essential, universal, metaphysical, enduring knowledge, rather than materialistic approximation that we have in science. We must also bear in mind that an anti-modern attitude is not at all the same as an anti-Western attitude, for only this can save the West from its own confusion. It's funny how hating the West is precisely a requirement of the modern attitude and the anti-traditional worldview itself. Therefore, in chapter 3, Knowledge and Action, uh, he shows that the modern tendency to contrast action and contemplation as polar opposites misses the point that no one person is purely defined by one or the other. In fact, properly understood, contemplation and action are complementary rather than contradictory. In fact, even in the Middle Ages, when people's nature tended to privilege action, this did not prevent them from recognizing the superiority of contemplation, that is, of real spiritual truths rather than, you know, ideal curiosities. The modern West, in which real contemplation is vanished and the crassest type of utilitarian pragmatism dominates as the only sane option, is a historical anomaly at odds even within its own history. The reason why contemplation is above action is the same reason why the unchanging is above change. Insofar as you make changes with action, these are all transitory and uh, momentary modifications of matter alone. Yet even these changes will not be truly understood without some unchanging principle which continues to maintain its superiority. The relation between knowledge and action is therefore that knowledge is the motionless mover even behind action itself. Knowledge therefore correlates more or less to what Julius Evola would call being, whereas action is a correlate of becoming. For this reason, matter is merely multiplicity and division, and materialism inevitably causes social conflict and strife to spiritual life and inhibits one from reaching the unity of consciousness or of universal principles. The truth about science is that any claims to dogmatic truth are ridiculous. In this realm, science is simply a chaotic succession of ever shorter lived theories, which always end up being disproven just a little later by someone else anyway. Insofar as applied science is valued for having results, these only bear directly on matter. In fact, even calling these discoveries is misplaced. They're more like mechanical inventions, as Jacques Ellul, for example, would agree. Yet even describing them in terms of disinterested theories in pursuit of the truth misses the point that they are most dangerous precisely to us. Even on a political level, elevating the metaphysics of becoming to the only standard of being necessarily leads to a denial of spiritual authority in favor of temporal power, which inevitably disintegrates the democratic mass itself. Over in chapter 4, The Sacred and Profane Sciences, he notes the historical fact that you really didn't have rationalism before Descartes, but that was because it was recognized that intellectual intuition is the best kind of insight into actually gaining access to enduring and certain knowledge. What the quantitative methods of modern science miss is therefore that reality is qualitative in nature. There are different degrees of it depending on how near the principles you are. There is just one metaphysics and just one truth contrary to uh, modern politically correct sensibilities forbidding such talk. And this is simply translated differently. Um, for different perspectives. He uses the metaphor of different languages of translation. However, this must not be taken too far into uh, the uh, 
in order to avoid the temptation of linguistification, which we have been criticizing all along. Even the non-metaphysical sciences and tradition, by the way, maintain a different kind of unity than we are used to today. Physics for Aristotle, for example, is not physics as we understand it in the modern sense, it's rather an inquiry into nature in general, which really just means trying to grasp the general rules of the realm of becoming. Modern physics, however, is not about all of nature. It has rather been subdivided to the point of utter absurdity, in which it is not possible for experts to talk to anyone outside their own sub-sub-sub-sub-sub-niche. Yet it's all too easy to miss the deeper point that the real reason why it cannot be unified is simply the lack of a higher principle beyond matter itself. This need for a higher principle was explicitly recognized by Aristotle as he acknowledged metaphysics' superiority over physics, but also its connection to it. The 19th century was therefore a very strange time when people actually celebrated their own ignorance by openly making agnosticism into a thing, without realizing that that just means professing that you don't know. Far from expanding knowledge to previously unimagined scales through amassing more and more data, this only restricted knowledge to the realm of becoming, without realizing that it would be hopelessly limited and limiting as a result. Far from deepening our knowledge, knowledge only became the superficial dispersion of many details in which one somehow could repeat the procedure infinitely without advancing a single step closer to the true knowledge, which remained fundamentally inaccessible to it as a result of its own restriction to the realm of matter. This makes sense since one only ever deals with probabilities and approximations within the realm of science, yet this was only because one had intentionally confined, confined oneself to the world of ephemeral changes. Yet there's also a hermeneutical problem. No matter how many facts you might amass, any one of them can only be interpreted if you already have some preconceived idea, which defeats the very methodology of disinterested inquiries into objective facts. In contrast with the empirical hypotheses regarding matter, which modern science is restricted to, tradition favored the direct intuition of truths which were infallibly known from the metaphysical order itself. The only reason why modern scientists have built up so many more empirical facts than their predecessors is that people in the traditional past simply had better things to think about. In comparison with the real truths of the metaphysical realm, this stuff was actually pretty dull. For this reason, it is a historical misrepresentation to say that astronomy came from astrology, or that chemistry came from alchemy, except in the negative sense of these being degenerations of these older fields of thought. In fact, no one today really fully knows ancient astrology itself, and true alchemy came to be known as the pseudoscience of transforming lead into gold only by the fools who interpreted its symbols too literally. In other words, alchemy was really about transposition into a spiritual domain, rather than the failed attempt at modern chemistry, which is, it is all too often portrayed to be. Similarly, there was no such thing as psychology in the ancient world, for the very specific reason that anything of interest in the realm of mental phenomena was subsumed in some higher point of view when it was dealing with spirit. It would not be left in the dead end of material analysis, in other words. The general rule of thumb in tradition is that any of these lower sciences is of interest only to the extent that it reflects the higher science or serves as some sort of preparation for it. For example, mathematics for the Pythagoreans is not an end in itself, but rather a pathway of access to deeper metaphysical truths. Likewise, it is not so much that there are any profane sciences as such, it's rather that a profane point of view dominates all of our dealings with the world today. That this point of view is not so much a thing in itself, it's rather merely negative. It's the uh, view of ignorance masquerading as the uh, view of knowledge itself. Because our science is confined to the lowest level, or in David Icke's words, uh, a low frequency of reality, and has voluntarily broken any bridge to a higher plane, it is a paradoxical science of ignorance, which is itself an oxymoron. Science meaning knowledge, and ignorance meaning not knowing.
Therefore, in Chapter 5, Individualism, he notes that the root cause of all of this is just individualism, which is the restriction of civilization to purely human elements. We call this today humanism, but humanism is not so much a positive thing as a negative absence of principles. Individualism specifically negates, for example, intellectual intuition because the latter is a super individual faculty in itself. By doing so, you lose any possibility for metaphysics. In fact, even those who claim to still be interested in metaphysics in modernity have a very different view of what that actually means. Metaphysics has now come to be misunderstood as a set of rational structures dictating how objects can appear. In other words, metaphysics is seen as being dependent on nature rather than the other way around. Worse still, even those who are willing to posit problems in this realm won't ever get around to actually providing solutions for them. Another sign of individualism is that the cult of the genius has forced us to obsess over inventing an original theory and then attaching our name to it, without realizing that in tradition, there was no such thing as owning a theory. If any idea really is a true idea in tradition, that is precisely because it has an independent existence. It belongs to anyone who can understand it. This understanding, or rather intelligence, is much broader than any modern concept of human reason. For, on the contrary, individualism is simply naturalism because the limits of the individual in this sense perfectly coincide with the limits of nature in the materialist sense. Not coincidentally, questions of truth eventually disappear altogether and to be replaced by questions of reality, which can only really mean the shifting matter which can be seen by the five senses. Eventually, truth becomes a dirty word itself, as utility becomes the only concern in the school of pragmatism, for example. Yet it's wrong to give Descartes too much credit for inventing this catastrophe. The conditions were already well in place for such a theory to make sense to people at that time. These conditions are, of course, just those of decline itself. Likewise, um, the revolt against tradition in the scientific revolution really was the Protestant Reformation as well, which was simply um, individualism in the realm of religion. With the democratization of religion with, say, Martin Luther, anyone's private judgment took precedence over any concept of spiritual authority whatsoever. Yet this itself made any hope of reaching doctrinal agreement impossible. The irony is that Habermas's formula for linguistic democratization is precisely what makes um, linguistic consensus impossible. Another paradox is that rationalism inevitably leads to sentimentalism, in which the religiosity of private feelings negates any claim to certainty. Naturally, even the people who practice the religion don't need to actually know anything about it, as obsession with morality overshadows any concern for doctrine. Even those who seem on the surface to be professional experts on doctrine, such as religious apologists, are actually more concerned about using debate as a means to an end to defeat their opponent than as any serious means of learning absolute truths of a spiritual nature. Therefore, in chapter 6, The Social Chaos, he shows that it is not enough to provide explanations of political problems from a merely sociological standpoint, because this sort of materialism lacks its own foundation and has to constantly begin anew. Instead, one must realize that political contingencies simply reflect the mental outlook of the time in general. Only a spiritual grasp of the truths of tradition can explain why in the West today, no one any, uh, any longer occupies the right place that they should in the social whole. Yet this is precisely because there is no longer any such thing as a place for them to occupy because there is no such thing as caste, as unpopular as such a concept might be. In the absence of a caste system, anyone simply struggles to snatch up whatever work he or she can, rather than do what intrinsically fulfills his or her own nature. The purely democratized Likewise, the purely democratized individual who is exactly like any other is a myth. If you negate the real qualitative differences among people, the result will inevitably be social chaos rather than harmony. As Julius Evola noted, the call for educational uniformity is simply the behaviorist 
idea that humans are just like Pavlov's dog. Anyone can be conditioned to do anything, provided you just control their environment and provide the right set of stimuli for them. Under this view, you don't have any excuse to not fit into some generic career role which the society has mandated for you. Of course, even the call for democratic communication has two exceptions. You're never allowed to discuss whether progress and democratic equality are legitimate, or even to find out what these terms actually mean. Democracy and progress, however, did not cause modernity through changing the world with an idea. Instead, they are ideological technologies which maintain the current system and are therefore espoused precisely by the same figures who profit from the status quo on a financial and political level. Nothing is more ridiculous than citing championing uh, democratic equality and progress as a rebellion against the system. In fact, any talk of ideas which change the world is ambiguous, since it overlooks the difference between the pure idea, which is accessible only in tradition, and the pseudo-idea of linguistification with which we traffic today. The pseudo-idea does not actually provide hermeneutical access to any independent spiritual truths. It is simply a social technology which intentionally provokes a certain sentimental reaction, specifically on the masses uh, as a collective rather than on a single individual thinker. The modern idols, insofar as we have them, are precisely made up of words, although the term idol was traditionally a spiritual matter. Likewise, democracy is itself a contradiction which doesn't really exist as advertised. The very idea of the people ruling itself violates a metaphysical law akin to the rule that the same thing cannot be both potential and actual at the same time. Even if people are nominally allowed to decide when voting, this misses the point that their decision is itself based on an opinion which is notoriously easy to manipulate in the form of propaganda. The claim for the majority to rule not only misses the point that true political competence can only ever lie in a minority. In other words, an incompetent majority is itself a logical redundancy. It also misses the deeper metaphysical point that the higher cannot emanate from the lower. Democracy is nothing more than materialism. Democracy is simply the outcome of a long procedure of temporal power usurping from spiritual power, which will not go on forever, but which will end the end of this era itself. Democracy is metaphysically impossible, by the way, similar to just as a square circle cannot actually be drawn within the space of Euclidean geometry and the idea of a penniless alcoholic drinking away the misery of living through a water-scarce dystopia one cheap beer at a time would be an ecologically impossible object. Um, Genoa is interested in metaphysically impossible objects, which democracy, the mass which rules and is ruled, would be. Yet the... Um, idea of a majority deciding simply because it's bigger is in itself just a law of matter in disguise because this is the idea that a large object can just bulldoze anything lying in its path. That's maybe true on physical levels, but it's a blatant reversal of the metaphysical law in which we have the exact opposite rules at work. A real community, by the way, cannot be just a sum total of a set of individual pieces. In order to have a real community, you have to have a, an organized social structure which abides by different laws. You have to have the establishment, controversial as it might be, of a type of power which is not that of a numerical majority, but is rather the aristocratic power in which a true elect would have to be um, elite on an intellectual rather than material level. Therefore, in chapter 7, A Material Civilization, he notes that our materialism is not exactly a passionate affirmation of matter, so much as it, it, it is defined by an indifference to non-material concerns. Even on the occasions when we do imagine the other world, it's always in material terms. This is similar to uh, Varg Vikernes' claim in Varksmal that um, even the uh, Christian monks who, uh, you know, uh, have the ascetic mortification of the flesh, they basically torture their own bodies. That's only because they imagine that the reward they'll get in the afterlife is the same kind of material pleasure which they are denying themselves now. They miss the point of how a spiritual hermeneutics would um, be uh, something 
uh, incomparable to the material objects we know, even when they try to think about heaven, says Varg Vigernus. Therefore, even religious sentimentality is materialism in disguise, because the only question is how a certain religious experience makes you feel rather than whether you're getting any access to something that is true. Still, this indifference causes us to support applied science simply by default, because it alone can provide immediate and tangible practical results. Science is therefore not distinct from the technological development of industry and machinery, because science already is the technological domination of matter, even when it seems to be functioning on a purely intellectual or epistemological level. Yet this does not make man the master of matter in any Frankfurt School of Critical Theory type of caricature, because it's rather man himself who is dominated and loses his humanity to become a machine and a slave as a result. Marx's claim that economic factors explain everything is therefore just the modern common sense of materialism in disguise. There's really nothing profound about that insight, contrary to what academic elites might say. And yet, it's also just plain wrong on empirical grounds, because the only thing which is constantly perfected on technical grounds in our society is not the economic production of goods, it's rather the destruction of war itself. This is why Jacques Ellul said technique cannot be equated with the Marxist concept of economic reductivism, because a lot of technology is actually not invested in producing, but rather in just blowing things up. Quite Quite fittingly, therefore, materialism is democratic, but only in the base sense that now anyone can die in war just as easily as anyone else. Yet this grotesque state was only the result of allowing the structures of feudalism to decay on the gamble that they'd just be replaced by something better. This is a mentality which uh, Ted Kaczynski and Jim Rickards have also noted is simply the gamble that disrupting some complex system, uh, which is likely to bring about unpredictable side effects, which um, are almost certain to be harmful, is something which uh, we can do this time because we're sure that although it didn't work in the past, it'll work now. Although, of course, it never does. Even if there are benefits, by the way, these are illusory. And worse yet, any claim to benefit presumes that anyone whatsoever has the same set of generic tastes and needs on a subjective level. Or rather, it's the idea that marketers have succeeded in forcing people to all want the same things which they just happen to be selling right now. As a result of globalization, customs are artificially imported into nations with no organic connect connection to them, and people are forced to labor more just to acquire the money to buy all of the stupid shit they didn't even know they wanted until some marketer from another nation told them to. Yet all of these artificial needs actually just make us more unhappy because suddenly we have so many more lacks, which we didn't have before. And anyone who fails to adopt the new attitude of consumption and careerism will be misunderstood and cast as an idler, a worthless parasite who wastes time, especially if he or she is dedicated to using that time for spiritual development, as Evola also noted. One law of matter, however, which will apply to this materialist civilization is that it will be destroyed in itself by material forces. We're not sure if those will be from nature or from the collective in which the power leak guarantees that a globalized collective will inevitably drive itself off the cliff. In contrast, spiritual traditions will actually survive only because of spiritual powers rather than through the pursuit of material wealth. Anyone who is not a hermeneutical idiot will surely see that religions have somehow miraculously survived to the present day, despite the fact that massive material opposition, which seem quantitatively larger, have um, uh, tried to remove them from existence. And yet this is only because some non-human power has played a role in allowing them to survive. Chapter 8, Western Encroachment, he notes that decline began in the West, but it is spreading everywhere now, and this is the real meaning of globalization, regardless of cliches of global capitalism, etc. Although the spirit of tradition cannot die because it's not material, one thing it can do is withdraw. He notes that if that were to happen, that would be the end of our world. Even though it might not be the end of matter sensation, it would be a hermeneutical death, to use my own terms. Like uh, David Icke, therefore, he invokes references to a Luciferian consciousness, 
to show that this is not merely the inevitable unfolding of material necessities within history. There actually is a diabolic, in every sense of the word, force behind modernism, which is uh, facilitating and guiding this entire tragic procedure. He warns people, therefore, to beware of counterfeit spiritualities. They might be sold at the local exotic bookstore or promoted by pseudo-evangelists who are simply preying on people who are discontent with these conditions but ignorant of the real truth. This will not be good enough because, once again, this isn't a game. You either have the real existence of spirit or you don't. You cannot simply linguistify a good imitation of it. Therefore, in chapter 9, he provides some conclusions by noting that, once again, truth must be distinguished from sentimental preference and conventional rule. A foundation as such must be distinguished from a meaningless multitude of democratic opinions. Knowledge must be distinguished from illusion. And our world must be recognized as purely negative, in essence, rather than pos a positive something at all. Although religion does still survive, the risk of preserving the letter without the spirit, even in ancient religions, is a risk which is simply the materialism of linguistification in disguise applied even to the realm of spirituality itself. Finally, remember that although the majority cannot be counted on to change their minds on this matter quickly, numbers don't actually matter, except in the literal realm of matter, no pun intended, because our domain is that of spirit. In other words, you do not have to have a democratic majority vote this stuff into office, even on the level of voting with their feet. It's rather that the spiritual um, possibly elite, will be able to ideally change things even if they are small in number but committed to the right spiritual principle. So thank you for watching this video. We have reached the end of the book. I look forward to more discussion.